I want to show you something really cool that I found the other day. Um, so we've talked a lot in the past about quantification. And this is a cool little quantification trick. So um, I'm going to jump over to my document camera. And let's check this out. Um, essentially, it is a way of making tally marks. So when you're counting things, you know, one hamster, two hamsters, three hamsters, four hamsters, five hamsters, that five, fifth one being the diagonal line, um, that has been kind of my, that's been my approach in the past. And there's a better way. What if there were a better way to make little tally marks? Now, <clears throat> You not, may not get very excited about these sorts of things, but this is the sort of thing that makes me just think like, wow, it's like a better mousetrap. And I'm already making tally marks in my nature journal. So like, what if there was a better mousetrap? <laughs> and there is, there is. Okay, so um, where is my alternate camera? Here we go. So, um, when I'm making lists in my journal, I will often, um, as I say, I'm going out, I'm watching birds and I see a ruby crowned kinglet, right? Um, I could write out, it is a ruby crowned kinglet. Can you rotate your... Oh yeah, let's, let's try that. Let's, uh, whoop. Uh, whoa. There we are. That better? You got it. All right. So I could write that out. And then I see one little ruby crown kinglet. I see another ruby crown kinglet. Um, they're usually sort of, they're around, but they're in kind of low numbers. So often hashtags, hash marks are a useful way of kind of keeping track of those things. First of all, here's a, a better way of doing this. So ruby crowned kinglet, um, what I do is I make these little abbreviations. Um, so it's that are four letter abbreviations. And so I will write Ruby crowned Kinglet, Ricky. And so that gives me just a way of really kind of quickly getting that name down. So these this system has been kind of standardized. Um, bird banders at Point Blue use this system. And um, so it's where they're called four letter codes. And it works great for just um, about all birds, but there are some birds where this four letter code ends up, oh, actually for, uh, makes, ends up being the same for two different birds. And we'll talk to you about that in just a moment. Um, so this is what I did for if there's, there are three words, ruby crowned kinglet in the name. So first letter, second letter, third letter, and I just sort of fill it in with what's there. Now let's say um, it was a um, a kill deer, all right? So kill deer, you just take the first four. So the kill deer becomes kill. <laughs> um, if it's a two um, word thing like a ready duck. Then you just take the first two of this and the first two of this. So it becomes a rudu. Um, and so this just allows me to, to write the names of birds. Oh, and if it's four, if there are four words in the bird's name, then of course it's the first of those four. Now for most of the birds that you're going to see, just knowing that pattern, is is great. Um, there's a few birds where the pattern that is made by this will overlap. Um, so for instance, there is a um, black-throated green warbler, black-throated gray warbler, and they both are going to end up, you know, the they're going to end up with the same code. So 
Um, there's a few birds where it ends up where you kind of get a, a different thing, but generally speaking, this is going to uh, work for you. In my uh, how to draw, um, I think it's in the how to draw birds book, I kind of go through these, or maybe it's the nature sketching and journaling one. In one of those books, um, I I kind of go through like here are some common birds that were that are exceptions. Um, but for for generally speaking, this is this is just a great way to kind of give yourself a shorthand for the bird. So I'm looking out my window right now, and there is there's a diju. Anybody know what that might be? Oh, look, there is also a moto out there. Um, to, usually when bird banders do it, they do it all caps, but I usually, um, if there's two that are combined, like these two, these two, it just sort of helps me keep track of it by M-O-D-O -O with an M. So I'm putting caps for the, the separate words. That traditionally when they do this, like bird or banders would go, would write it like that, modo. But I, for me, it's easier to kind of keep a track of it this way. So I've got a Diju out there in a modo. And um, I'm going to uh, just jump over to my um, gallery view for a second, take a peek around. Give me a thumbs up if you know what either my Modo or my Diju are. Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science is on top of it. Ve has got them. Uh, OK. Yep, those are common birds here in North America. Walters, it's going to be harder for you because we're talking about birds here in North America. So don't feel bad. Um, the uh, so that was my uh, that was my uh, my dark eyed junko and my morning dove. Uh, but some of them end up being really cute. Um, like 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 beaky, beaky. Look, it's a beaky, right? You actually hear some bird watchers walking around calling the birds by these. They'll say like, look, you know, it's a ricky. Ricky, isn't that cool? See, it's Ricky. And, um, oh, Ricky, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind, hey, Ricky, all right? And uh, the beaky is the belted kingfisher. So some of them, it's just, it's fun. So that's fun, but wait, let's say we want to tally these because that's where we started with this, right? So let's tally them up. So you could tally them old school, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, more, okay, five, six, seven, eight, cool. But what if there were a better way? And friends, there is. So here is how it looks. First critter that I see of the ruby crown kinglet here, I give myself a dot. Now, second bird that comes in, I give myself a dot. Next bird that comes in, I get another dot, but it's making a box shape here. Fourth bird, you know where this is going. So one, two, three, four have been those dots. Oh, look, there's a fifth one. This is a lot of ruby crown kinglets. They've decided to start behaving, I don't know, like bush tits. Bush tits. Uh, B-U-T-I. Booty. Booty. Look, it's a booty. Oh, it's bootyful, right? Um, so look at, what, look at what you can do. So for number five, I'm going to do this. Number six. Number seven and number eight. Number nine is a diagonal slash. Number 10 is a diagonal slash the other way. So let's say I look out there on the pond and there are, um, so if I, if I, <clears throat> I, I, I can count things. This is great for things when you're counting individual birds. If you're estimating and saying there are about 500 birds out there, then I'm going to go ruddy ducks, um, 500. And, uh, but if I'm counting individual ones, Oh, by the way, if I'm counting 500, I count about 500 on this pond and the next pond, there are seven more. I don't say that I have 507 because that implies this level of, like if I was counting by 50s here, then when I get um, 50 more, I'll add another 50 into it. But if you have something that, when you write out something like 507, it implies that you have actually counted up every bird. 
because you've got that precision in your notes, but it's actually a misleading precision, All right? So I wouldn't do that, but let's say um, there are um, 11 dark eyed juncos. I could do this. There's 11 and another one. See what I did? I just made a box with an X through it and that's 10. And then I gave myself another one. What about morning doves? Let's say there were 22 morning doves. I could just go like this. Once you get up to numbers where let's um, like the, the, let's say there were, you know, around 40 bush tits, I'm not going to be using this system. So this system is good when you're counting individual birdies. So let me just do this one more time. This is one. Well, actually, what I can do is I wrote this down in my journal. Look at that. So there it is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Isn't that clever? I thought that was that. So that's better than tally marks. That's better than tally marks. <laughs> and that makes me happy. Um, and then what you, you can do if you're kind of just trying to get quick 30 of them, it is faster to do like here. It's if I wanted to draw 30 bush tits, it's faster to do this. than this. So that's why you can, if there's, you know, like there's 22, I would, I might just kind of sync up my 20 like that. But then from this point on, when I am now counting individual ones, I'm going to keep those as separate boxes. If I need kind of a quick 20 or 30 on there, this is the easy way to do it. I thought that was really clever. It's just fun. Just like one more little kind of, one kind of neat way to geek out with something. And um, when I saw that, I knew first of all, that I had to write that in the back of my journal. I wanna start using this. And then I also, I wanted to share it with all of you. So that's, that's, that's useful. So mad props to whoever thought of that system. I don't know how long it's been around. If anybody does find out who invented it, please let me know, because I would like to give them a shout out and mad props. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I am now, um, so um, Avea or Brian, if you've had a chance to look over the, um, the, the suggestions here, what, what do you think we should do today? There's a couple of people who are kind of asking for goals. Should we mess with some goals? Sure. That sounds great. I think Yavia has had one that she's wanted for oh, a while, well, which involves that? using colored pencil for birds. So maybe you could just do that with the goals. Um, so, yes, Avia? I was asking on um, a couple of weeks ago, somebody had asked that during a different um, Ask Jack. Some, somebody, I don't think he's here today, unfortunately, but he was asking about coloring birds with colored pencils. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Um, I think, wait, hold on a moment. My daughter is about to have to go back into her class for distance learning. And so I just wanna make sure that she knows one moment.
we're wearing many different hats today. All right, um, so yeah, let's, um, let's see here. So there, people are asking about colored pencils. Um, we've got um, a request for, so, so people are interested in colored pencils and the birdies. Um, let's, let's explore that. Uh, we have a re request both for gulls and also for the spruce grass. And so maybe we can um, take a look at both of those. Oh, I wanna share with you folks, Michael Warren. You know how I like to show you different examples of, of different illustrators, right? You're thinking, I want to do colored pencil. I want to do birds, hmm, right? I want to show you somebody who um, does some crazy cool stuff with that. And it's in two styles. One is sort of the, like, I'm going to get in there and in my studio, noodle in lots of details. But this person's colored pencil stuff, <laughs> you're going to like this. So check this guy out. And maybe while I'm doing this, um, uh, Ivea and Brian, would you folks make, um, uh, it, it, this would be a great time for doing kind of community announcements. Let's do that while I am trying to find this book on a disorganized bookshelf and I'll be back. I, I can start, I don't mind. Um, so um, oh, let me just quickly spotlight myself. Okay, there we go. Um, so I invite people to, um, to as we do each week, to join us for Pencil Miles and Chill, um, Friday mornings at 9 Pacific time and Saturday afternoons 3 Pacific time. Um, we have lots of good fun. We have an awesome <laughs> ongoing book list that we kind of keep adding to. So you can see that if you check in. We have the most awesome company. Um, wonderful people each time and then and then we just get to sketch together so everybody is as usual invited and um next monday on the 15th at um five o'clock five to six i'll be beginning my uh my se seven part plant series about plant families and our foods so that will go up on facebook a bit later folks are invited if you want to take a couple of deep dives into some into some families and just get more used to looking at botany. It could be a supplemental for the class on Thursday that Jack's going to teach. Thank you. Okay, to you, Brian. That's very exciting, Avail. We're all looking forward to that class. I'm just having a class on Saturday for the Great Valley Nature Journal Club, so everyone's welcome to join that at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll start using drawing tools to help us look more closely at nature. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. I have colored pencils. Are you ready? Because I want to introduce you folks to Michael Warren. Michael, come on in. Found this book in a used bookstore some time ago. I love me some used bookstore. So all my, like, I've got all these crazy books on my shelf and like almost all of them came from haunting used bookstore. And I, I saw this colored pencil approach uh, for handling birds and it, well, you'll like it. Let's check it out. All right, the book is Shorelines. Um, uh, Birds at the Water's Edge by Michael Warren. All right. Um, so this is a watercolor painting. Um, and he has a very kind of very tight style. But look at, look at this. Look at this business here. Um, so th here we have, let's zoom down on that a little. All right. So these are little colored pencil sketches. And so a couple of interesting things. Um, there are a bunch of just sort of hash lines that are making sort of backgrounds, which makes light breasted birds pop up so that you can see them. 
there is he's using um, here a um, the colored pencil itself to draw in the bird and just a very simple shading uh, approach. This book cost $12. This book was $12 and I couldn't believe it. Uh, no, you find good stuff in, um, so this, I'm, I'm gonna skip past a bunch of the, there are these sort of lovely watercolors, but what I wanna pay a little bit more attention to are these colored pencil studies. Look at those crazy textures. So this, something like this, don't think of this as a field sketch. This was probably done in the comfort of a studio. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of finely worked out, but the, the pencil technique here is really interesting to see. Just, you know, even like how do you, how he is handling these areas of, of reeds and plants back here, just sort of sets these kind of groups of diagonal strokes and it's in layers. Look at these ones here. Hold on, I've got so much stuff piled up on my desk now that it's, I need to move these things. Oops, wrong way. All right, so this is interesting to me. Um, so this water is shown with real horizontal strokes. And a little bit more fill in in the water so you get that reflection approach there. We've talked before about kind of carving in angles on our sketches. And these birds, he, he also really, he's really looking for those angles. Sometimes if you get too lost in the, um, if you get too lost in the curves, you don't sort of see the inflection points and in things. then he's really, really pushing the um, angles there on the head of this one. And this is cool. Look at this, this sort of complex ground here. So he's, what's going on here? Um, he's doing a lot of the drawing with a gray colored pencil. And that's the first establishing that there are these grasses coming down this way and that there are these other ones on the water or ice surface here. And then throwing in some color around some of the edges of those. And, um, but also notice how he's letting some still remain white kind of gives you the more of a sense of this being kind of light straw colored stuff instead of this ground appearing yellow and orange. He's also then punching in some darks in a few places. So like right here, he's coming in with darks here in some of the spaces between some of these grasses here, right? <clears throat> Look at this interesting grass approach right here. Just diagonal strokes. This is um, probably first coming in with this yellow, this light yellow green one and putting those marks in and then coming in with a second layer of those darker greens across the top of it. Let's, so we're going to skip past some of his watercolors. We're going to go to more of You think you look at something like this and you're like, oh my gosh, that would be impossible to 
draw with colored pencil. How do you do that? What he's doing is he is taking a, a pale green colored pencil and before he colors in the ibis here, he is doop, 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 drawing in these green ones and then he is just coloring in in the spaces between those. So the green marks that he has first put in creates the little holes um, it creates the, 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 uh, the, the lines that he's going to work around in painting in that ibis. And then he's putting in, so the light green came in first, and then he's putting in this dark green in the spaces between them. Let me just zoom down on that a little bit more so you can see that. I think this illustrator has figured out some really clever ways of getting a little bit more out of those colored pencils. And then again, what the, the, the trick is when you're looking at something like this, you think to yourself, what is the order of your pencils? So I'm guessing there's first a light gray pencil sketch um, of the ibis. Then the green plants came in in front of it, these light green ones. And then he punched in the colors and values of the ibis and the dark greens around it. Let's take a look at theirs. Here you can see him, there, there's this sort of medium tone gray pencil that he does a lot of this work with. I'm suspecting that he's initially sketching it in with a pencil that is that color. And then coming by back and, and putting in a few of the other, um, other colors around it at the end, popping in just a few little accents and details. <clears throat> he seems to be using a fairly sharp colored pencil um, for a lot of the lines on the birds. And also um, what he is doing is uh, very much in the way that Bill Berry does. There are, I'm gonna use this as a little pointer here. Take a look at I'm going to zoom on the back of this bird here. Look at these little contour lines across the back of this bird. And then you if uh, let's see if it, sh it shows up barely on the screen here. He also has some other light lines going this way in this part of the wing. So these little lines help you see different planes on the surface of the bird. Here's another good example of him doing this, what we call contour shading. And not you, there we go. Hmm. Fortunately, the, it's not coming out um, very clearly on the screen that I'm looking at. I'm gonna try to adjust this and see if It'll refocus and get in some of uh, no. Um, the it appears that my my camera isn't showing it. He's got some very pale lines that wrap around this way in this area, and those pale lines are wrapping this direction down here. So his lines are actually carving around the bird. He's using a very subtle kind of cross hatching effect there to suggest the roundness of the belly of the bird. <laughs> I 
let's just take a look at a few more. This is fun. This is fun. This guy obviously is a naturalist spending time in the field. This is this wonderful little moment here. Dun, 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 dun. Hello, I'm going to get you. Too bad. <laughs> That's fun. So look at, look at this. These... Um, so these horizontals really establish this, this, this ground plane. And they also allow you to have the belly of this bird be white. And there his, he's doing his two colors of pencil, making his grass. Again, this grass here was drawn before the weasel or stoat. So before he gets in there and draws in his stoat, he is drawing in this, these grasses, and then the stoat works around those. This here looks like he drew the weasel first. Here he drew the weasel first and then drew the grasses over it, and then said to himself, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I drew my grasses first because this really looks like colored pencil drawn over the stoat, right? Then down here, he draws in the grasses first and then uses the location of those grasses to be places where he doesn't draw in his, his stoat. I think that this colored pencil approach has lots, lots, <clears throat> check this out, lots of applicability to and sort of transference to our, uh, what we're doing with our, our nature journaling. So as I analyze this, and I'm thinking to myself, <clears throat> all right. I, again, when I when I look at drawings like these, I think to myself, all right, what what are you doing? What are what is your process? I'm going to try to break down what I think Michael Warren is doing here. Um, And let me see any last pencil sketches that I want to share out. Um, yeah, let me look at that. He also does these 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 very kind of worked in watercolors. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. That's that's studio drawing. So that's a studio drawing. Um, what I'm assuming is watercolor. But let's focus here on these. Colored pencil sketches. One last little set here. Something that uh, happens a lot in, uh, in, in books is very often the illust illustrations are, are reduced a little bit um, to kind of tighten them up. It makes us illustrators look better. So very often when I'm looking at illustrations in a book, if there's some way I can enlarge them as we are here, it really helps me sort of see their approach better. So notice a couple other things about this line. Notice that this is a variable line going around the, the belly here. Line is, is coming down here, gets lighter, really is punched in darker here, gets lighter again. In this little area right here on the belly, it appears to me 
that he's also taking a different pencil. So he's, he's initially blocking it in with this light gray pencil. He also has a, a darker pencil that you can see a little bit of right there, a little bit of there. And I think that that's coming in at the very end of the drawing. So I think we see some of the, I think this person is using kind of that move from dark, from light to dark approach that we see with watercolor and applying that to, um, to colored pencil drawing. Starting with this light gray pencil, then, um, and you know, so this branch would have come across before this bird gets filled in. So that way he knows where to stop coloring in this bird. And then he's coming in with the darker pencil at the end and putting in this eye line, a little bit of the detail in the beak, this line here, strengthening that a little bit, coming in, getting some of these kind of air, adding these dark accents here, 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 a few dark accents in the tail. I strongly suspect that that was the order of operations of drawing this lovely little bird. CD's warbler, <clears throat> according to the notes that he has here. So let's try to play with this ourselves. Maybe um, here we go. If I do my pen, my drawing with a uh, My, if I make my sketches and drawings with a graphite pencil, graphite tends to be, oops, I gotta zoom out. Uh, graphite tends to be a lot more smudgy than, um, than other media. Um, and uh, my pencils will, my, uh, my, my colored pencils, will smudge and smear my, my, my drawing. So consider, um, another thing I can do here, I'm gonna draw, do this whole thing. I'm gonna try to do this sort of in the approach that I believe uh, Michael Warren is taking. So I'd say I've got a couple of uh, gray pencils here. And I am going to start. Well, that this one is so light. You're not able to see that one at all. So that's not going to be helpful for us. It would be helpful for sort of for the, the final drawing that I'm doing. So I'm going to use a darker pencil here so that you can see my kind of my lines a little bit better. Um, let me. So I like always to, to block in my, my basic shape at the start of a drawing. We've talked about that approach before, but now I'm gonna to try to apply this more, uh, just sort of to sort of play with this just as a, as a colored pencil drawing. So what I'm going to do is kind of go around this drawing and work it in as a light gray pencil drawing. My eye sits on top of this line here. My wing droops down here. In the class this weekend, I did a lot of stuff on 
kind of looking at how how I sort of initially block in a bird and about simplifying the wing and some of the patterns on the head of the bird. I will have those classes. Um, I'm starting to, to, to upload those, those, those now. But uh, this light gray pencil seems to do a nice job of blocking in my shapes. Now what I'm going to do is draw over these with, uh, oh, actually here's, this will be fun. I, um, I'm going to pretend I'm uh, Michael Warren now. <laughs> and uh, let's say that this thing is in a, it's going to be in a bush here with uh, some vegetation over it. Um, so if I put those in before kind of noodling in my other lines, um, that will help me kind of figure out how to sort of where to, where to stop this other one. So this bird is going to be holding on to another little branch here. I often will put in my bird feet before putting in the branch that the bird is sitting on. And that allows me to kind of get my feet in the in a right place. The branch I can then kind of mold to meet where my feet go. And it's that I get a better result than kind of trying to do it the other way. This is sort of feeling like a Buick's Wren to me. So um, behind the scenes here, I'm um, just pulling pulling up on my computer. I just did a Google image search for Buick's Wrens, and um, I just wanted to have uh, accessible to me a photograph or two of Buick's Wrens, so that. Um, my drawing ends up being uh, a little bit more, a little bit more accurate. All right, got enough information for me now. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some, um, some color onto this. And so I've got sort of a fawn colored pencil here. I have nice little round pencil. Um, it's a good idea to test your colored pencils off on the side of your page before your colored pencils hit your, um, hit your bird drawing. So, whoops, let's come here. So I'm just taking my pencils and kind of going like, oh, this one makes this color. Uh, this one here makes this color. All right, um, what, about, what about you? Oh, you're a little bit too rusty red, right? But I don't want to put that on here and go like, oh, it's too rusty red. It's often hard to erase a, um, a, a, a colored pencil. Um, now I'm going to just give this bird a little bit of background color. And because I have drawn in those two plants crossing over it, I know where to stop. Kind of using Michael Warren's trick there. So just like we did with watercolor, 
we're starting lighter and we are then going to be progressively going darker. So now I've got a darker colored pencil. This is a dark umber. And uh, let's see which dark pencil I really want to use. Moment. Okay. So I'm putting a layer of pencil over that first layer of pencil. And I can let some of my pencil strokes show through as kind of texture. So if I want the back here to be a plane, those lines can show up and show through. Here. If you look at the tip of my pencil, there is sort of a chiseled tip um, because it's of kind of drawing this way for a while. There's, there's, it's sort of flattened it down. But if I turn it, I still have a sharp edge that I can that I can draw with. And so for things like this, I want I want to get that sharp edge working for me. allow me to draw sort of fine little details. Um, warblers have little, I mean, sorry, uh, wrens have little bars across their wings. So notice I'm kind of watercolor style going from dark to light. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from light to dark. So. If my pencil starts to get too dull, I spin it slightly in my fingers. Then at the end, I'm going to get You know, remember how Michael Warren had that one little kind of line that was popped in there. I can pick a few of these lines and emphasize them. I want the belly, uh, the, well, the belly of these birds is sort of a, is a warm, a warm gray. And so I'm going to take a light gray pencil and put that across the belly of the bird. Now it's just a little bit too gray and I'm going to brown it up a little bit. And if I draw with my pencil on this way, it's a nice broad line. I spin that pencil in my fingers and it's now making a, 
a thinner line so I can think of how thick or thin do I want those lines to be. There we go. And Michael Warren was doing those wonderful backgrounds. Um, I just want to remind you of the sort of stuff that's inspiring me here. Um, um, like, look at this little guy. Um, that's cool. Let's zoom down on that again. That's really fun. Then simpler right over here. Look at this, just cross hatching lines in the background. Hmm. I like that. So because I have these, uh, whoop, not you, back up. There we go. Overall color of this isn't feeling very Buick's I mean, uh, Ren to me. Um, so I'm going to just sort of see if I put, just want to sort of dull this ochery stuff out with, bring it more kind of umbry. That's better. With the colored pencils, you can um, you can add layers of pencils. As long as you don't press too hard right at the start. Now I'm going to just uh, try to get all Michael Warrenny on the background here. I'm going to take. Uh, I'll start with sort of a dull, olivey green. No, that's a little bit too close to the color. Ah, yeah, that'll work. So.
If I want that to really feel like it is popping closer to the body there. Well, I'm glad I checked that color before it went down. I don't like that color. There we go. I like this better. Go a slightly different angle here. Primarily doing that to get that white breast to pop out. I want that to feel when I've gotten distracted from the grouse and the call that I wanted to do. Sorry about that, folks. But I hope that some of these kind of colored pencil y strategies will, will be helpful. The final thing I want to do um, in here is kind of crisp up some of these edges. Um, I want um, a greater sort of range of, of darks. Right now, there's a lot in sort of medium value here. Um, and so I'm going to Combine and just give myself a little bit more punch in those areas. I'm trying to be intentional about, you know, if, like here in the chest, it looks better. I'm going to have two little boxes here. Um, here's A and B. Um, it's going to be, if, if I just do smooth across, that's okay. Sometimes I may want that, but if I can actually show, have some of those pencil strokes show through, then I think that that gives you, you get more of a sense of the volume or texture in something like that. I think that that is a, that that's really useful. Was my attempt at kind of a, a Michael Warren inspired Buick's rant. Before I leave it, I want to just kind of generally look it over and uh, see if there's any glaring things that I could do to to improve it. And I've got, I've got two ideas. Um, 
One is, I think I want to give just a little bit of on the eye. I'm going to give a little hint of eye ring. Let's see, where's the sharp part of my, there's my sharp part of my pencil. Just to give a little more pop around that eye. And also the shape of the beak feels off to me. It feels a little bit heavy and, and, and thick in here. Now erasing with the colored pencils is hard. So I'm gonna to try to just take a gel pen and see if I can just trim that a little bit by just taking some white and bringing that there feels a little bit too sharp. So I'm going to blunt the tip of it and trimming into it. Hmm. Still doesn't feel quite right to me. The um, there's a uh, one strategy that a number of uh, illustrators have when they're drawing a bird is they first really kind of get the the beak and um, the beak and head zone and the beak to eye especially looking right, kind of giving you the right expression of the bird. You want maybe that, see if that, that gets a little bit more curved. Now it still feels too thick to me. Yeah. Um, Trimming with my gel pen. Well, at some point. I need to just sort of say good enough. Um, still not, it's still not looking quite right to me. The, uh, the danger is the more that I get in there and I fuss with it, the more what we call kind of overworked and busy that part of the drawing becomes. And uh, maybe if I bring the feathers up on its forehead a little bit, let me just try. Oops, just dropped my pencil on the ground. Fortunately, it was a polychromos pencil that are a little bit less prone to breaking. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to sharpen my pencil. Overworking a drawing sort of means that, you know, the part that was giving you the most trouble, like right up here with this beak, you just end up having tons of detail and tons of lines. And then what happens is the part of your drawing that was giving you the most trouble will become the first part that people will look at because there's just so much detail kind of going on in there. And, um, so there's, there's often kind of diminishing returns from kind of getting into the part of the drawing that is giving you the most trouble and kind of fussing with it. And I'm very much in that zone right now. Um, often it's good just to kind of quit that and uh, just sort of let it be. So I think I'll just let this be. That's, 
good enough. Oh, one more little line. That was fun. Um, I really like taking a look at other artists and seeing what, what they're doing that inspires me. And um, it makes me do things, make marks in different ways. And that, that's, that's good. Um, I want to regularly kind of shake myself out of my comfort zone and and see what what I can do to kind of you know get strategies from other people. You can do the same thing just looking at the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. You see somebody's approach there, you kind of go like, I like that. I, I think that's a that's a nice way to be approaching something. And I can play with um, with their ideas. So here are ideas that I was directly stealing um, or appropriating and borrowing from from looking at Michael Warren's pictures is I wanted to intentionally get those pencil strokes showing in to show sort of part of the planes of something. I wanted to block it in with gray. I wanted to hit some of those darks at the end. I also wanted to have a background um, with a value that would then pop out the, these, the, the, the belly and things like that. Um, <laughs> so I never got to um, the grouse or the uh, the gall. So um, Ray Bonto and Walters, my, my apologies. Um, I had the best intentions settling out, but uh, my, my my brain just took me in a different direction. Um, perhaps an, another time. But uh, also just wanted to use this as as an example. Just the, the idea of let's play with other people's approaches. And then when you do that yourself, it doesn't mean that you are, um, you don't become a clone of whoever it is because you're taking what you have and what you do, you're using them for inspiration using that as a springboard to get you to do something different. And I think that that's really useful. So I hope that this demo was fun for you today and that, uh, uh, even though it wasn't a gall or a grouse, um, you had some fun with a lovely little uh, Buick's wren, and we did play with those color pencils. So let's jump over to our community cam. And if anybody here has a uh, a sketch or a journal entry or things that they've been doing that they wanted to share. Um, I see uh, um, Walters, uh, good to have you with us again. Let's, let's start there. And oh, you have been playing with galls and colored paper and doing nice botanical studies here. This is cool. I can't wait to uh, check in with you. Let's see what we can do to allow you to unmute yourself. Uh, you can now unmute yourself. Yes. Hello, everybody. So I uh, I was just asking about the gulls and some shadows because I was doing, uh, I was sketching some gulls on the harbor we have here. And uh, there were some quite interesting shadows where the light hit them. It was purely white, but uh, on the other side where there was the shadow, it was like kind of bluish grayish. So I thought maybe I would do like the thing uh, that I would color white the part that hit the, the, uh, the part that the sun hits them and leave the paper. So you uh, leave the paper blank in the places where there's the shadow. But this one somehow didn't quite turn out as I would like to, I liked it, so I couldn't figure it out quite uh, how to show the shadows on tone paper. Um, so 
the you're you're doing something that is absolutely right, and that is that you've got the idea of how can I use the color of the toned paper as one of my values to help me be able to do that. Because otherwise, you know, since you're on on toned paper, why not use that sort of strength of the the toned paper? Let me grab a piece of toned paper from over here, and I'll just do a quick little demo on that. All right. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, show folks some of the botanical notes that you've been taking. Now, this these these are just some from uh, Jack's uh, last uh, Jack's last uh, uh, session that was botanical illustration. These are some that I made sketches, and this is something I started writing today. So you were talking about like how you have in America this uh, four coded uh, uh, letter for birds. So, uh, I started working on it. So we'll have a lot to go. These are only, uh, we have some swans here and some, uh, uh, some geese, ducks. Yeah, these are all ducks. So still, so still have uh, waders, wading birds, warblers, Falcons, eagles, all that stuff to go through. Oh, that's that's a, a really good uh, approach there. Um, I'm I'm going to just do a a, a quick little uh, golly demo. Um, now that I, I sort of see the challenge that you're up against, and you're using gouache, is that right, Walters? Yes. All right. Um, so here is just um, quick gall with gouache. Um, so I have a head and a back a little step. And I'm giving my goal way too big a chest, but that's okay. So the, the, the sun in my drawing is going to be coming from the back of the bird here. And I, um, uh, maybe I'll just block in with my pencil a little bit more. And the legs are going to come out somewhere down here. All right. So I want to use some of the color of the paper as my as my white. Um, what? Um, very often, if there's an object that is out here, it's going to be reflecting light back this direction. And um, so let me see here. Uh, 
test this off on the side. Something that is, you're probably finding this too, that when you first put your gouache down on your page, it feels really bright and then it dries more pale. It's kind of frustrating, isn't it? Um, but my gall has no eye. Um, this part of its body is going to be getting in really, really bright sun. And then somewhere in there, there's going to be that, that zone where you kind of go into that shadow. And I want when I'm I, my my gouache on my palette is dried, and so when I wet it, if I add too much water, then I really get this extreme um, darkening effect when it dries. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take the tip of my brush and swirl it into here into kind of a thick paste. So then when I put that down that thicker paste, it's going to be, it's going to stay bright. So I'm going to have maybe this part of my head be um, bright, and then the belly is going to be going into shadow there. And then on the back here, uh, it's going to be a darker gray back. And I want it to So here is the back of my, my gall. I am going to have it be um, kind of close to the color of the paper. And then on the belly, I'm gonna soften that a little bit. Um, that white is the white in shadow. The, the cool thing is that the white in shadow can be this almost the same value as the um, <clears throat> as the back in light. So I've got the dark back in light, and I have the white belly in shadow, and that that can be the 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 same color, the color of the the, the paper. Really wish I gave my bird a, a uh, an eye. I can stick that in later. Oops, wanted that to be yellow. Not a little orange gate. Another thing I can do to make this breast out here, like if if you find that so if you look at the value of this, 
and the value of this, they're the same, All right? Um, but I want people to think the this value here as being the shadow in dark and this value here as being the dark in light. So one way I can do that to make this breast feel lighter is if I put a dark value next to it. And you see that that really pops that really pops that breast as being light because I want to see it get even brighter. Look at this. The darker it gets adjacent to it, then all of a sudden your eye sees that contrast and goes like, oh, that place there where you have that dark, that is, that is white breast. If I'm seeing a cool shadow color being reflected into this, I can go ahead and put some of those things in. So for instance, let's say there's a little bit of blue down in here. I can even put that in, but because there's this dark here, people will say to themselves, oh yeah, that is, that's that white, that's that white belly. I'm gonna to try to get all the Lars Janssen here on you and put in a little bit of <laughs> um, ochre down there. And that still feels like, oh, it's white, white chest. Were any of those thoughts, um, Walters, I'd love to hear your, your, your thoughts and feedbacks on that as I jack an eyeball into this, if, if that is um, answering and, and addressing the, the, the question and the thought that you had. I think it is the, uh, the, the thing you mentioned with the dark background, I think that might help that might help to give uh, to give the feeling. But the main problem for me was that I thought that there was too much of a too of a step value between the shadow and the white. Uh, mm. yeah. of, you can see you can see right here. This is it. It's. It's quite rough, so there's just the white line, and then it's kind of this pale gray. So that was confusing to me. Yeah, mm, I might. I wanted to make the transition a bit like smoother, so uh, it the it doesn't feel like the colors differ that so much. I, I got you. Yeah. Um, if there is a sharp, um, if there's a sharp change in the, um, if there's a sharp change in the value, people will read that as there is a change in the angle of the plane on the head. So if I've got something that is smoothly rounded, then very often the, 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 the shadows and planes on that are going to be, um, there'll be a, a gentle transition. But if there's a sudden step that, <clears throat> that goes from, um, so if, if I have an object, two objects here, and you're looking down on both of them, and if light is coming from this direction, On one of them, um, oops, I don't want you there. I want you here. This one here is going to have light here, and I'm going to sort of fade it as it gets up here. Right. 
So there's more of a smooth transition between that light part and that dark part, then that feels more like a smooth curve. But any place where there is, there's a sudden step in value, you're like, oh, that is going over a little pyramid. So there's a sharp edge there. So you, the, you're, you're right that a, a smooth transition um, implies a rounded surface. A sharp transition implies a, a change, a sharp change in those planes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, let's see uh, what else folks have been up to. Um, would love to, uh, if you, there's something, a journal page that you want to share, hold it up to your screen. And um, Diane, good to see you. And thank you for joining us. Hi guys, um, I did your bird nest class last week or whenever that was. And so yesterday I did this marsh wren yeah, and today I've been working on it today, nest. Let me back it out a little bit. And uh, so I started with watercolor and then with class today, I got out my color pencils and did over it. And I think it helped with the depth. It's not done, but um, it would seem to be a good combination, the watercolor and pencils. I, I agree with you. I the could we take another look at it? Yeah. It needs some depth, I feel, but well, uh, in the bottom right hand corner where you're also really pushing in a bunch of those darks. Yeah. You really get a feeling in there of the all the, the layering of those. Um, I think that's some of the and also there in around that entrance where um you kind of are pushing some of those darks too it's really those zones you feel like there is there's there's a lot of of, of depth and possibility in those so that's that's fun yeah so playing with the values in this is going to be yeah. the, the game changer that's really cool to see thank you the but the challenge is what you were facing what i i always overdo i think that's one of the challenges you know pencil miles and overdoing it yeah um there's i i i wish that on 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 drawings there was you know if you've ever cook a turkey um some turkeys will come with these little gizmos in them um that where a little thing pops out when the turkey is done right the little turkey timer <laughs> um there's no such thing on our drawings and I like that. It would be like like time to stop. You'd be like, oh, okay, yeah. cool. Time to stop. Back away. <laughs> That's right. Step away from the pencil, right? You know. And come back later. Oh, the black shirt. Step away from the pencil. Anyway. Step away from the pencil. Now the um, the 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 problem is that when you start to like you know mess with it more, like a little good thing will happen, and you'll get. So you get these little kind of dopamine hits early on from messing with that. And so your brain says, that was good. Keep doing that. Especially when you're putting in detail, you put in a little bit of detail. Ooh, that feels good. So you just, you then dump detail over the whole crazy thing and it flattens the drawing out and it, you know, it kills it with care. I've done a whole series of bird nests. Some have the birds, but um, I'm an architect and I started looking with the pandemic and I'm right on Clear Lake. So I see all these birds. Oh, great. And uh, I started thinking about, oh my gosh, nests are the architecture of birds. So I'm calling this project Bird Built and I'm just presenting it to my art group, but um, it has been so enlightening in your 
your help has been invaluable. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Diane. Um, it'd be really fun to see you bring some of, you know, the think about some of these uh, do do like at least or, or I'd love for you to play with a couple of these bird built things and do it as if you were presenting design documents, design build plans to a client. And the client is like the Wren, right? Or the Vireo. And so like, you know, here's the plan and the elevation and the detail. And, you know, with that cool architect print and sort of, you know, show them how to construct this thing. And, you know, with all the, the, the labels and the little, you know, data oh, box. In the my corner. mind is just going right now. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? It'd be fun. I would love to see that. Yeah. I would love to see uh, like an architect going all like gonzo nature journaling, but still kind of keeping that architect aesthetic. Wow. Thank you for that. I am going to mull that whole thing over. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, no, if, if it sounds like fun, go ahead and do it. Yeah. If it sounds like, nah, it's not my thing, then then totally ignore the suggestion. I'm play with it for sure. Okay, cool. I can't wait to see. That's cool. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I'm jumping back to the gallery. Um, Ray Bonto, great to see you. Sorry, we did not do your grouse today. I actually, I was starting off going like, ah, I'm going to do a grouse. And <laughs> it didn't happen. Um, and, uh, but. Uh, That's all right. This class was amazing. Uh, and, and also, uh, I drew so heavily <laughs> with the polychro uh, polychromos is harder than prismacolors, so you get less layers. Um, for me at least. Um, um, and there's a hole in the paper now, <laughs> <laughs> right on the breast here. Uh, but still, it's all oh, fine. I mean, it's not exactly a hole. It's just um, if you the, poke the it through, then it's can you see the oh, yeah. bonus oh, yeah. paper? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, mm. and, and again, well done on, um, it's good to see you in the class yesterday. I like the way you are suggesting the shape and detail on the wing. And um, as you often do, you've, your line variation, thick lines, um, uh, thick lines in some places, thin lines in others, that is fantastic. Thank you. That's really cool to see. So, um, then before I do all that, uh, I decided to quickly sketch the sketches you uh, you showed, and I decided to just do the starting bit here. Oh. Cool. And let's see those two sketches up on the the on the on the other page. Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're using that cool brown pencil that you use, right? Yeah. I like that 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 sepia effect. That's really cool. And so you're just dropping in these really fast as we're going. So you know, folks, just sort of notice all. Um, we, we you know if, if I if I. Uh, show something on the screen, Ray Bonto is usually also, you know, even if it's going to be shown just briefly, he's got a little sketch of it. And that's, that's really cool to see. Just uh, it removes the fear of putting something like that in. Yeah, I also... Yesterday, I decided to do some value sketching with the dark brown on tone 10. Oh. Uh, uh, turn the angle of it a little bit so that, oh, there we go. This is exciting. This is inspiring. This is really exciting to see. Yeah, and, and so no, I, I see that there are also parts on these where you actually, you got the color of the paper and that color of the paper is you're intentionally using that as one of your values. And then 
You're using the pencil then to push the darks and the whites to push the lights. And so you're doing push pull on both those ends and leaving some parts that are the value of the paper. That is, that's the approach. Yeah, um, this is the goal. Uh, I was a bit, you know, overworked on it because I wanted to get rid of the outline. Oh, that's, that's really fun. And it's, it's delightful how the, the white just pops. The white pops on this toned paper. That's exciting to see. And it's also, again, it's, it's neat to see that, um, that, that how the tone by the breast there really pops the va white value of that breast. Yeah, yes, I also sketched this, um, you call it, yeah, some kind of buzzard. Ah, uh, yes. Nice. Yeah, I used a bit so, of it. So folks, notice that you, you know, here you can put that white value, um, you can either put a dark value onto the page, you can also put a light value onto the, the page sort of around the bird. So both of those are, are options to you, as you're seeing here. That's really fun to see. Thank you so much. Yeah, and speaking of more colored pencil, I uh, the, it snowed uh, today. It snowed, yes, uh, and we went out. Oh, and you so, went, this is, and so now we're, we're doing nature journaling out there. Can no, not out there. Uh, I came back and did this from memory. Great. Um, this is from outside the window. So yeah, everything else is from memory. Oh. Right. So yeah, just yeah. like um, our, our, our friend Bill Berry, you're doing some things practicing from life, others from memory. That's terrific. Yes. And uh, it was about one inch deep in snow. Wow. Well, yeah. Winter Wonderland out there. Um, I want to encourage you to share this page on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, with, um, if you don't feel comfortable, there's no pressure or anything like that. Um, but if you do, it'd be fun to, 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 to share those, those, those observations and journal notes. Yeah. Um, here, I did all the buds that I could see. Yeah. Uh, here. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, here's some oh, pigeons. pigeons. Yep. Seagulls, crows, and a blue tit. I, I, I am so jealous of you getting to see that bird. I have blue tit envy. Oh my gosh, that is such a crazy cool bird. That's really fun. Yes, That's it's only. Really fun. It's only the second time I've seen one. It's ah, it's see, rare that's really good to get outside and start exploring around. That's exciting to see. So cool. Yeah, and the snow was, it was light snow. So it was not just falling like that, but it was going in all directions, up, down. Aww, <laughs> what a wonderful day. So good to be outside. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you shared this. And Oh yeah, I, I I want to go find photographs now of blue tits and sketch for sketch those for a bit because I mean that's I mean what a spectacular bird that's such a cool bird. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to close out now because I need to help my daughter get um, online um, to uh, to kind of join her uh, her class doing a, a new project today. But I want to thank everybody here for. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us today and just want to remind folks, stay safe, be kind, and let's grab those journals and get out there and explore. Um, Ray Bonta went out and there was a blue tit outside the house. Who knows what you're going to run into? Whatever you run into, you can make it wonderful and special for you through the act of attention, the attention that you give to it. 
is what pulls out the magic in it and, and makes it sparkle. So let's find something in your neighborhood. You can make the common and ordinary extraordinary just through an act of simple attention. You take a nest and you start to give it that deep attention like Diane was doing. And all of a sudden, it's this wonderful little moment in, in front of you. So let's see what you can find to make the ordinary extraordinary through an act of attention. And thank you all so much for being with us today.